Right. If we now look at the, re the reactions that become a little bit more challenging, because I think this was now easy enough. Let's make it a little bit more challenging because it's, it's cold enough so that your brains are functioning very well today. Let's make it a little bit more complex. What we've had so far, we had a very nice symmetrical molecule. Let's just put it back so that you can see what we had. Right. Okay. Um, there, this is what we had. We had a nice symmetrical molecule. You see it looks exactly the same on both sides. So whether I add, say for instance I wanted to add HBr, whether I add the H there and the Br there or the other way around wouldn't make any difference because the bromine would be on an end carbon atom anyway whether you turn it that way around or that way around. But if we now look at what I've got now, then it, things are becoming a little bit more complicated because now I've got an asymmetrical molecule. It's not symmetrical anymore. So now I must be very, very careful when I add something to this molecule because it's not going to be the same if I add it wherever I want to. Obviously, if you add a symmetrical molecule like HH, that is not going to be a problem because the one H goes there and the other H goes there. So the addition reaction is going to be H there and H there. Or if I wanted to add bromine, then the one bromine goes there and the other one there, there is no difference. But say now, for instance, I want to add an asymmetrical molecule like this one. Now I've got a little bit of a problem, and that is where am I going to put the H and where the BR? Because if I put it like that, then we find, oh, but the double bond breaks. Okay, so there I've got them available. And if I put the bromine there, then the bromine is going to be on carbon atom number one. So this is propane, and that is going to be one bromopropane. If I put the bromine there, it's going to be two bromopropane, because then the bromo is attached to the second carbon atom, which is definitely not the same substance. So how would I know which one goes where? Now here I have to tell you a little story first. Um, that, that I think might help you a little bit to figure this out. You know, hydrogen is the most abundant element, but how much do we actually know about hydrogen? I mean, you've got billions of hydrogen atoms in your body, but you know so little about them. Now, let me tell you a little secret about hydrogen atoms, the secret lives of hydrogen atoms. And that is that hydrogen atoms are very cute, sweet little things. But something that's quite interesting is that they are very, very social. They just love to hang around with other hydrogen atoms. They are party animals. This property of hydrogen was figured out, believe it or not, by a Russian with the name of Vladimir Markovnikov. Now, he said that a hydrogen atom will always go where the other hydrogen atoms are. So let's look again at our reaction that we've got here. So now you've got the double bonds broken. So there you've got now the two arms available. And the hydrogen has to go somewhere now. It has to go there or there. But now that you know something about these social party animal little things, what do you think? Where is this hydrogen going? Because the bromine couldn't care less. It will just go anywhere. But the hydrogen, where is that going? All right, let's check. This one is attached to two boring carbon atoms and just one other hydrogen atom. This one is attached to another carbon atom, but it's got two hydrogen atoms. So where is the party? Ah, goody, goody. There it goes, where the other hydrogens are, and then the bromine will go there. So the fact that the hydrogen will go to the carbon that contains more hydrogen atoms, this one contains more uh, hydrogen atoms than that one, that is Markovnikov's rule. So now it's very easy to figure out where it will go. You can even <coughs> add HOH like that. And now once again, in other words, 
water. So what will happen? Where will the H go? And where will the OH go? Well, we know now about the H, it's secret, that it loves parties. So the H will definitely go there where the other H's are, and this OH will go there. And now it's something that is just interesting, and that is about primary and secondary, because this is now an alcohol, it contains an OH group. Now, something about primary and secondary alcohols. Now, if the OH group was there, let's just check whether that would now be primary or secondary. Primary, pr prima, means one. Then it means that the carbon atom to which the OH is attached, because it's OH that makes an alcohol an alcohol, the carbon to which the OH attached is attached to, at the most, one other carbon atom. In plain terms, it means that it must be a carbon atom that is at the end of the chain. It, it can only be attached to, at the most, at one other carbon atom. So this is then a primary alcohol, because that C is attached to just one other C. If this OH group is attached to that carbon, then the C to which the functional group is attached, the OH group is attached, that C is attached to two other carbons. So in other words, it's a carbon somewhere in the middle of the chain. And secundu means two. So in other words, this is attached to two other carbons, and therefore it, this is a secondary alcohol. Now, I think you can guess now what will a tertiary alcohol be. Tertiary, third, three. So that will then be if a carbon atom to which the OH is attached, if that is attached to three others, so if this was then also a carbon, this was a carbon, that, and that. So the carbon to which the OH is, is attached is attached to three other carbons then it's a tertiary alcohol. So now you know what is a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary alcohol. So you can see that Markovnikov's rule then actually tells us whether we are going to get a primary or a secondary alcohol if we add water. Or if you add HBr, whether we're going to get a primary or a secondary haloalkane. This is then a very important thing to remember. This is Markovnikov's rule. Now, let's now move on to the question and see that we can actually answer the questions. Right. If we now look again at the question and we see that we have now got the uh, reactions, number P, Q, and R. And P is shows you where the CH3, CH, CH2, changes into an alcohol. Now, if we look at what happened there, how is it possible for that substance to change into an alcohol? Well, in the first place, an alcohol hasn't got a double bond, so that double bond must go, and an alcohol has got an OH. So how can I get an OH onto that one? Right, so what we are looking at here is that if you've got now um, okay, let's start here, maybe. Let's start with a CH3 in the left, bottom left-hand corner. CH3, CHBr, CH3. That is the substance in the left-hand corner. Now, what you see is reaction number Q. It changes into an alcohol. If I want to change this into an alcohol, well, in the first place, I know that an alcohol doesn't contain a BR, so that must go. Right, I can't have an alcohol with a BR. And furthermore, an alcohol must have an OH. Right, now where do we normally get OHs? We get it from an alkali, for instance, KOH. Please note that NaOH would also work. So you get an OH from there. That comes in the place of the BR. What kind of reaction is this, by the way, where the OH and the BR, where, the, where they exchange places? This is called a substitution reaction. And I want you to please note that the substitution of a halogen by an OH group is called hydrolysis 
I'm going to write it down now, now, but this is called hydrolysis. So this is a hydrolysis reaction. It is a substitution reaction, but it is a hydrolysis reaction. So this is the reaction that is taking place in number Q, where the CH3, CHOH, uh, CH, BR, CH3 changes into the alcohol. This is reaction number Q. Right, let's look at reaction number R. In reaction number R, we've got this, okay? And what happens there is that, first of all, we see that the substance that it changes into is CH3, CH, CH2. In other words, that must go. And then, if that is gone, then we've got this forming a double bond. Now, what do we call this reaction where you remove an HBr, where you remove something from a substance? That is called an elimination reaction. I have eliminated. The HBr has been removed. It's been eliminated from this molecule. Or you can also call it a dehydrogen bromination or a dehydrogen halogenation. So this is now out. But please no take note that this reaction also takes place in the presence of KOH or NaOH. But now I've got a little bit of a problem. What you will notice is I've now just had the same substance changing in two ways. In both cases, I had KOH. In the one instance, what I found, in the one instance, I had the bromine, which was replaced by the OH. And in the other instance, these have been eliminated and a double bond was formed. So this was reaction. This was um, reaction number where the OH and the BR, where they exchanged. This was reaction number Q. And this elimination is reaction number um, R. So how would I know whether a reaction, when I've got um, this, well, this is then an alkane that contains a halogen, so it's an haloalkane. If I've got an haloalkane and I've got KOH, how do I know whether that will undergo elimination or whether it's going to undergo substitution? Now, here I have to tell you a story quickly, and that is that a while ago, I watched a very, very disturbing movie. I was really, I was not in a good mood for a couple of days about this movie. It was about the underworld. I think it was the mafia. Where what, disturb, what I found so disturbing was that, you know, they had no respect for a human life. If somebody doesn't do a job properly, they will just be killed or something like that. Now, I always try to get something positive out of the worst of situations. And you won't believe me, but what I got from this horrible movie was that I got a way to remember when am I going to get this reaction that we've just been looking at, these two reactions, when am I going to get substitution and when am I going to get elimination? Now, I want you now to picture this, that we've got now this mafia boss, this godfather, and he has now given some other assignment to one of his, to the thugs, one of his underlings, and this poor guy didn't carry it out according to his liking. So now this godfather has to decide on the fate of this poor guy. He can either be replaced, in other words, substitution can take place, or he must be eliminated. They must get rid of him. So if you can now picture, if this boss is, is hot and sweaty, what is he more likely to do? Eliminate. But if he's in a cool, air-conditioned office, he will probably say, I'll just substitute the guy to get somebody else. The other thing that I want you to think about is this. If this one has been drinking too much, this godfather, and he's got a headache, he's really not feeling good from all the liquor, what is he more likely to do? Eliminate. But if he's been having a cold glass of water all the time instead, he'd rather say, oh, just substitute the guy. It's okay. And then the third thing is if he, things are intense, you know, if it's concentrated, 
then I think he is also more likely to go for the elimination option rather than when he is relaxed and so on to go for the substitution option. Why do I say this? Because you see what happens here is that if you would now mix this haloalkane with KOH or NOH, then these conditions are going to determine whether you are going to get elimination or substitution. A higher temperature favors elimination. The lower, more sort of lower temperature will, si will favor substitution. Then furthermore, the presence of alcohol, the more alcohol is present, if you would, for instance, dissolve the KOH in alcohol, then elimination. But if you would dissolve it in water, no alcohol, then it will be substitution. And then if the KOH or the sodium hydroxide, if that is diluted, it will probably be substitution. But if it's concentrated, it will probably go for elimination. You see, those are the conditions, and now it's very easy to remember that. There's one more factor, which is not going to influence this one in particular, but if you look at a haloalkane, and you have to decide whether this haloalkane is going to be more likely to undergo substitution or elimination, then we also have to look at whether it's a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary. If we can maybe just look at the example that I've got here again. Say now, for instance, We've got uh, the bromine is, is on that C, right. You see what happens now, you remember what I said about the hydrogens being these social, nice, cute little things? You see what happens now is this is a primary haloalkane. Now this bromine has got right next to its side, it's got two nice, friendly, cute little hydrogens that's going to plead for him. What do you think, what will a primary haloalkane probably then undergo. Well, these are going to say, oh, come on, he's a nice guy, he'll do the job properly next time. That will then probably be substitution. If it's a secondary, you see now he's got only one friend with him on the carbon. There are two other carbons, just one nice little hydrogen. So his chances are getting smaller. So then you can get both substitution and elimination. But if this is another carbon, no hydrogens on the same carbon, then he's in trouble. There are no hydrogens that can plead for him, and then it will be elimination again. All right. So this then determines these. Now, I just want to quickly show you these three equations, P, Q, and R. Um, I'm trying to get it all on this one. I hope we can see them. Right. So what happens with P... You start off with propene, right? It's CH3, CH, CH2. And then in order to get the alcohol, what happens there is that this H goes to the party, it goes there, and that OH goes there, right? And that's why you end up with CH3, COH, CH3. And that is reaction number P, and that will then be called an addition reaction or if you want to you can in more detail say it's a hydration right so that deals then with p if we look at q then what you see there is you've got this one and then you've got koh and they say that in q it changes into an alcohol so what happens is that bromine there is substituted by that one and that is why you will see that you've got the OH there now and the BR, you've got it there. So it's substitution. And you remember what I said? That this kind of reaction where the halogen is replaced by an OH from an alkali is then called hydrolysis. That is important that you know that. And then the last one is R, which is then where you've got the CH3, CHBR, CH3, that changes into a double bond, and we know to get the double bond, you have to do some elimination, right? And that is what is going to be eliminated, and then the double bond will be formed in between. And this is now where you can actually now see, this is now where you can see the difference between the hydrolysis 
um, where, the, where you've got the concentrated, and uh, here where you've got the elimination, you've got concentrated KOH, high temperature, and the KOH is also present, and high temperature, concentrated, and in alcohol. There you've got water, low temperature, and so on. Right, so this deals then with all, you can look at the questions that we've got there. We have actually answered all the questions.